Software engineering is essentially an engineering discipline that involves designing, implementing, maintaining complex computer programs, simply known as software. Code is written in programming languages. In the early days of computers, these languages were the machine language and the assembly language. Computers at the central processing unit level understand nothing but zeros and ones, and machine language, or machine code, was developed and used to control the CPU. Machine code is strictly numerical, and its instructions look something like this. A more human-readable form of machine language is the assembly language, and it uses mnemonic codes to refer to machine code instead of using numeric values of machine code instructions directly. An assembler program converts the assembly language code into machine code instructions that can be executed. As you can see, this is a bit more readable than machine code, but still not ideal. And that is where high-level programming languages like these come into the picture. These are more modern languages that have syntax that is closer to natural languages, and they automate tasks like memory management and a bunch of other things so that the process of developing programs with these languages becomes much more simpler and understandable. In modern times, these high-level programming languages are generally what software engineers create software with. But the computer still only understands zeros and ones. That hasn't changed. So the source code of these high-level programming languages is converted into machine code by programs like compilers and assemblers. Although some high-level languages, like Python, are interpreted languages, and they do not have to be compiled, but we won't get into that in this video. Languages also have a set of libraries. Not these, but rather libraries of software that can be imported into and used by computer programs for software development. These libraries can be anything from configuration data or message templates to subroutines, classes, or pre-written code. The main advantage of importing and using these libraries in programs is that they provide implementation of commonly used behaviors by software programs. For example, TensorFlow is a library that helps create and train machine learning models in Python and even JavaScript. Java Math Library allows you to perform mathematical operations on numbers, while D3.js helps you bring data to life in web apps. Besides the libraries, there are also software frameworks that provide a standard way to build and deploy software. Each language has its own set of frameworks. These frameworks provide a set structure and generic functionality, which engineers can extend by adding their own custom code to implement custom functionality for their particular software application. Along with programming languages, there are certain programming paradigms that help you classify languages based on their features. Languages can also satisfy multiple programming paradigms. Some programming paradigms mainly influence how code is organized. A popular one is functional programming. It involves putting blocks of code that perform specific tasks like sorting a list or converting world currencies into their own individual functions. These functions are just like functions in calculus. They take one or more input values and process them to return the desired output. The main program can call these functions when needed to perform tasks, and the functions can call each other as well when needed. This approach to programming keeps the code clean, reduces bugs, and makes the code easier to test. There's also object-oriented programming, which centers around the concept of objects that interact with each other. These objects usually contain two things, data and code. Data is usually the object's properties or attributes, and code is the object's procedures, also known as methods. One thing that is essential to object-oriented programming is called a class. Not this one, but rather, it looks something like this. A class is a definition for the format of data and the available procedures or methods. A class has its own internal class variables and available methods that its objects can use. There are also class objects, which are instances of a class that can be created by the developer or automatically by the program anywhere in the program after a class has been declared. 
The class instance has its own variable with values that are specific to that particular instance. To better understand this, let's look at this example. Consider a class person to define any human being. Then the class's object, which is an instance of that class, would be a particular person with their own name and identity. There can be multiple objects or instances of a class. The instance variables in this case would be things like the individual person's email, home address, or income. And the class methods would be actions that you can take for that particular person. Another paradigm is called modular programming. It encourages developers to separate software functionality into independent and interchangeable modules. Code can be logically split up into different modules that can be then imported into the main module of the program which can serve as the control center of that program. Instead of having a giant file consisting all of the code, splitting the code up into parts helps keep the code organized and more readable. It also makes life easier for testing and debugging. It's also worth noting that computers have a finite amount of resources, and so it's ideal to use them in the most efficient way. That is where the paradigm of concurrent programming becomes quite important. It is the idea of ensuring that programs perform computations in overlapping time periods instead of sequentially. This can be done using a computer architecture concept called multi-threading. The CPU provides multiple threads of execution concurrently so that the program does not need to wait for a particular operation to complete before proceeding to the next operation. Programs can be made to use the multi-threading ability of CPUs for faster execution. Two of the most important topics in computer science and software engineering are data structures and algorithms. These topics are also very closely related to the field of mathematics. Let's first look at the data structures. We can look at data structures as a way of organizing data that allows for efficient access to and manipulation of that data. The choice of which data structure to use in a given situation depends on the problem at hand that the program is trying to solve. An array is a data structure that contains a collection of elements, generally known as values. Values are identified by their corresponding indices or positions in the array, so that the value of this array at index 2 is 0. The array has a lower bound, which is at index 0, because unlike normal people, software engineers start counting from 0 instead of 1. That's just how it is. The upper bound of an array is at the last index. In this case, it is at index 4. One use of arrays in the real world, for example, is in the software that keeps track of the leaderboard in sports competitions. If you think about it, leaderboards are simply collections of athlete names that are sorted by the amount of points each athlete has. You can also store data elements in a matrix. Matrices are essentially 2D arrays. They have rows and columns which are used together to access and modify elements in it. For example, the top left element of the matrix is located at position matrix 00, while the bottom right element is at position matrix 24. Matrices work really well for creating things like seismic surveys and image recognition software. And then there's the hash table, also known as a hash map. Hash maps are all about key value pairs. But first, let's talk about what hashing is. Hashing involves transforming a longer string of characters into a usually shorter fixed length string that represents the original string. This shorter transformed string is also known as the hash code of the original string and the transformation is carried out by something called a hash function. The hash function's job is to use the original string to generate its associated hash code using a predetermined algorithm. The generated hash code determines where the key's value is stored. When searching for a value in a hash map using a particular key input, the key is hashed and matched with an existing hash code in the data structure to find out where the corresponding value is located. Hash tables are often used to index and retrieve entries from databases since it's faster to look through all the shorter and fixed length hashes rather than going through all the original keys to find the desired items. They're also used in cryptography.
A type of a list is called a linked list. Linked lists are a linear collection of elements. However, unlike arrays, which have to be stored in a continuous block of physical memory, linked lists do not have to do that, and the order of their elements is not determined by their physical placement in the memory. Instead, these types of lists are formed by linking together individual nodes to form a sequence. Each node contains a value and a pointer or link to the next node. This makes inserting and deleting elements very efficient from anywhere in the sequence during iteration. Linked lists are great for things like music apps for example. If you think about it, a playlist is a linked list of songs. Skipping a song to go to the next one is like moving from one note to the next in that linked list. Adding or removing a song equates to adding or removing a node from the linked list, and so on. There's more than just one type of linked list though. For example, there are doubly linked lists which are made up of nodes with links to both the previous and the next nodes in the sequence. And then there are also circular linked lists, but we won't get into that for now. Another data structure consisting of nodes and links is called a graph. Graphs have a set of vertices and nodes. They also have another set of either unordered or ordered pairs of these vertices, depending on whether the graph is an undirected or directed graph. These pairs of vertices represent the edges of the graph, which are also known as links. Graphs are widely used in navigation applications to be able to find the shortest path between one point to another. Another very important data structure is the tree. It does kind of look like a tree, but from a parallel upside down universe. Basically, trees have a root node at the top to start with, and then they branch out with all the child nodes that are linked by the edges or links. This is yet again a data structure that involves nodes and links. Any subsection of the original tree that also satisfies properties of a tree data structure is called a subtree and the topmost node in that subtree is called the root node of that subtree and the parent of all its child nodes. All nodes linked below that parent node are called child nodes. The nodes without any child nodes are called leaf nodes. The height of the tree is determined by the number of levels. In this case, the height is 4. In the real world, tree data structures are often used in gaming and other scenarios where a hierarchical representation of data is required. For example, in folders and files on your computer. And then there's the stack data structure. It is what it sounds like essentially. It's a stack of elements of any type usually represented vertically. Stacks have a top and bottom and elements can only be inserted or deleted at the top of the stack, just like a stack in real life. Hence the rule to remember with stacks is called LIFO or last in first out. The element that was last inserted in the stack will be the first one to be removed from the data structure if and when required. Stacks make great data structures to use for things like notifications for apps on your phone. A similar data structure to stacks is called a queue. Queues have a rear and a front. Elements in a queue are added or pushed only from the rear which can be deleted or popped only from the front. Hence, queues follow the rule of first in first out, or FIFO. The element that was first inserted in the queue will be the first one to be removed from the data structure if and when required. Queues are often used in email applications. What goes hand in hand with the topic of data structures are algorithms. While data structures store data, Algorithms process that data and perform calculations to find a solution to a well-defined problem. We can define algorithms as a finite set of well-defined instructions that are also computer implementable. Those instructions are unambiguous, which means that the computer will do exactly what it's been instructed to do. Nothing more and nothing less. There are different categories of algorithms that can be used to solve different kinds of problems. Divide and Conquer is a category of algorithms that divides the problem at hand into smaller subproblems and then solves those subproblems recursively and combines their solutions to form a global solution to the original problem. In this case, 
The algorithm is sorting a list by splitting the original list into two at each step until there is only one element in each of the split lists. Then, it compares the elements in those lists and sorts them accordingly, and merges them back together. It repeats this process of sorting and merging the lists until there is only one and final sorted list. And then, there are greedy algorithms, which are based on the idea of taking the best option now regardless of the consequences in hopes that having local optimum solutions result in a global optimum solution. For example, if a friend asks to borrow $47 and there are $1 and $2 coins and $5, $10 and $20 bills available, then to give that amount of money with the least number of bills and coins, you would take the maximum number of the largest denomination bills first, then the maximum number of the second largest denomination bill, then the third and so on. So, in this case, two $20 bills, one $5 bill, and one $2 coin can make up $47. In situations where we are not able to bring the total amount to the desired value using the current combination of bills and coins, we can go back and change the number of one or more bills or coins to make a difference. Then, we move on to recursive algorithms. The main idea of recursive algorithms is that they solve certain base cases of problems directly and then recur with simple subproblems. They do this recursion by having functions call themselves. Let's look at an example of calculating the Fibonacci numbers from the Fibonacci sequence using recursion. The Fibonacci sequence starts with a 0 and 1, which are the base cases, and the next numbers are determined by adding the previous two numbers in the sequence. So. To calculate Fibonacci of 5, for example, a recursive function is needed that within its body calls itself with the inputs 3 and 4, and then within itself calls itself again with the inputs 1 and 2, and so on. You get the idea. It's a function within a function within a function within a function. It's almost like Inception. It's great. And then there's dynamic programming. This can also be considered a paradigm. It's based on the idea of saving past results instead of calculating them again and again every time you need them. This is great for optimization. Once again, let's take a look at the previous example of the recursive function to calculate the Fibonacci number of a given input. Note that the function recursively calculated the Fib of 3 two times. The first is the one on the left where Fib of 5 calls Fib of 3 and Fib of 4. And the second one is the one on the right when fib of 4 calls fib of 2 and fib of 3. The second function call could have been avoided if there was a way to store the result of the first fib of 3 function call, which would mean faster execution of the algorithm. So, using this approach of dynamic programming, the result of fib of 3, or fib of any number that has been calculated once before, can be saved in a list, which we can search for answers in, if needed in the future. There are also algorithms that involve backtracking. Or simply put, backtracking algorithms move forward by making each available choice that can be made at each step. If a backtracking algorithm reaches a dead end or does not find a solution after making a series of choices, then it backtracks and proceeds to make the remaining choices in an attempt to find the solution. In this maze, the algorithm reached a dead end and backtracked twice before it found its way to the finish line. Branch and bound algorithms assume the original problem to be the root problem, and they form a tree of subproblems as the algorithm progresses forward. A method is used to construct an upper and lower bound at each node, and at each node, if the bounds match, it's deemed a feasible solution to that subproblem. If the bounds don't match, it partitions the problem at that node to make two subproblems into its children nodes. Then it continues trimming sections of the tree using the best known feasible solution until all nodes have been solved or trimmed. Algorithms that use random numbers for computations to make decisions are known as randomized algorithms. An example is an algorithm that factors prime numbers by choosing random numbers as divisors. Not so sophisticated and efficient, and therefore not often used algorithms are brute force algorithms. These algorithms involve trying every single available possibility until a solution is found. Use of brute force is generally not considered a good coding practice, and I wouldn't recommend using it anywhere. Unless you're trying to brute force your way into guessing someone's password, of course. 
but even that's quite difficult, so forget about it. Of course, these are not the only types of algorithms, but who's even watching the video at this point? An important fact about algorithms is that they need time and memory space to run. And since those resources are finite, programmers must choose the most efficient algorithm available to solve a particular problem. So we could say that when solving a problem, any algorithm whose usage of time and space grows slower than the rest as the size of the input grows should be prioritized for use. There's a whole topic of time and space complexity which we won't get into in this video. Software generates and uses a lot of data, and that data needs a place for permanent storage. So let's talk about databases. The interactions between software applications or users and the databases are called database transactions. Transactions can include things like adding, removing, or updating data in a database. There are three main parties in a transaction. The first one is of course the database itself, where the data is stored. The second one is the DBMS, or the Database Management System, which interacts with and manages the database. And then there are the end users that use the DBMS to interact with the database. These end users can either be applications or engineers directly interacting with the DBMS. These interactions between the DBMS and the end users are facilitated by APIs or application programming interfaces which are software intermediaries that allow end users and the DBMS to talk to each other using a certain framework. There are certain ideal properties of a database transaction that must be ensured. But before we look at that, let's look at a relational database, the most common type of database out there. Relational databases electronically store data in a row and column format within tables in the database. This one, for example, has three columns, one for the animal, another for the type of animal, and the last one for the animal's diet. Each of the rows contain a record for each animal. In large-scale real-world applications, the number of columns and rows can be in the millions. So now, we have a general idea of how database transactions occur and about the inner workings of how databases store data. Now it's important to talk about the ideal properties of database transactions. The atomicity property dictates that a transaction must either complete fully or not happen at all. It cannot complete partially. Ensuring atomicity prevents end users from making partial updates to the database, which would cause greater issues than if the whole transaction were to be rejected. Meanwhile, database consistency is important because it helps to keep the database organized and reduces potential bugs. To satisfy this property, databases regulate the data that is being added to them and reject any data that doesn't follow the rules. This means that if a column is set to only accept string values or number values or boolean values, then it will reject all attempts of adding any fields to those columns that do not conform to the rules. The isolation property focuses on how transaction integrity is visible to other systems and users. While a higher isolation level prevents many users from accessing the same data at the same time, a lower isolation level does allow for many users to do that, but it also increases the negative effects of concurrency, such as lost updates or dirty reads. The durability of transactions ensures that changes to the database that have been successfully committed will survive permanently, despite any system failures like crashes, service outages, or other failures. This can be achieved by using change logs that can be referenced when databases are restarted or restored. But let's leave that for another time. From the animals database table above, the three different columns, animal, type, and diet can be considered three different entities that relate to one another in some way. These relationships are usually modeled in an entity relationship model, also known as an ER model. These relationships can be one-to-one, one-to-many, or many-to-one. For example, animals can only be of one type. A homo sapien can only be a mammal, and never a bird, since homo sapiens don't have wings unfortunately. Maybe they should try Red Bull. Anyways, on the other hand, the type mammal can include more than one animal, like homo sapiens and elephants. In other words, many animals can be of one type 
This is called a many to one relationship between the animal and the type columns. And this model works well for describing these types of relationships. SQL is the most common programming language used to communicate with databases. SQL statements, which are also known as queries, can be used to view, update, or delete data in database tables. These are some common SQL-based relationship database management systems. While SQL and relational databases appeared almost 50 years ago and have been the preferred method for data storage, in recent times, there has been a move towards non-relational databases, generally known as NoSQL. NoSQL databases have their own set of benefits. Some of these databases are column family, graph, document, and key value pair databases. To create anything meaningful, good planning and organization is necessary, and software development is no different. The process of software development is known as the software development life cycle. There are considered to be seven stages of a software development life cycle. Planning, requirements gathering, design and prototyping, software development, testing, deployment and operations, and maintenance. The aim of the SDLC is to produce the highest quality software with the lowest cost in the shortest time possible. Over the last several decades, a number of SDLC models have been developed and used widely throughout the industry. One of those is the waterfall model. It's kind of exactly what it sounds like. It's a sequential development process. According to this model of software development, progress happens steadily as the project moves through the different phases towards the conclusion, just like a waterfall. This is the classic method of development which is tried and tested but it's also quite slow. It's too resource intensive for small startups to follow, but it works decently for large enterprises. A more modern SDLC approach for both startups and large enterprises is the Agile methodology. It requires the ability of the team to adapt at every stage of the development process. It also encourages evolutionary development, early delivery and continuous improvement of the software. At a macro level, Development with Agile looks something like this. You start the project and go through your development cycles, and when the release is near, you work with end users to confirm if the project can be deployed. If not, then the requested changes should be implemented and incorporated into the project, and then proceed to the next iteration. This method is much faster than Waterfall, and it puts greater emphasis on the user experience and input. The last methodology that we're going to talk about is DevOps. It is a set of practices that require the development and the operations teams to collaborate with each other throughout the SDLC. It encourages working on different stages in a continuous loop. The plan, code, build, and test stages fall into the development team's side, and the release, deploy, operate, and monitor and maintain stages fall into the operations team side. Hence, the methodology gets its name, DevOps. DevOps works well with Agile to incorporate development and operations, make software highly responsive to consumer feedback, and automate deployment processes. There are essentially three main types of software out there. Enterprise applications are software products that cater to large businesses and corporations. For example, a customer relationship management system is considered an enterprise level application. Consumer applications are targeted towards individual customers. These include phone apps, games, social media sites, and more. Open source software is basically open to the public and it can be inspected, modified, and enhanced by any individual or organization for their own use. Open source software is generally great for control, training, security, and stability. When developing native software, which is software that doesn't run on web browsers, but instead runs locally on devices like computers, phones, or servers, the software is closely dependent on how the operating systems are architectured on those devices. The development of native applications will differ slightly on different operating systems and devices. The operating systems of devices become irrelevant when developing web applications though, obviously because web apps run in web browsers. 
And although there are some differences in different web browsers, web apps usually work just fine across different browsers, which is not the case for native applications. So let's say if we've coded a swanky new web application that runs locally on your computer, which you can access through a browser. How do you make it visible to potential customers? That's where hosting comes in. Software and the data that goes along with it needs to exist in some place. There are two ways to host any kind of software, on premises or in the cloud. Hosting on premises means that you can have it run on dedicated servers that you can purchase and manage. This has a few plus points. It gives you physical and offline access to data and there's no annual fee or subscription costs, except for the operation costs of course. There's also a feeling of security since you know that your software and data is secure at your location. Hosting in the cloud simply means that you offload the duties of acquiring and maintaining servers to a cloud provider so that you can actually focus on building great software. This has some amazing advantages. Since you don't have to acquire servers to start hosting your application, there's a low upfront cost. You can simply make an account with any of the cloud providers to get started within minutes. Of course, they do come with recurring fees that are generally based on pay-per-use policies. Servers are automatically updated and fully managed by cloud providers, and data security with these cloud providers is top-notch. Hosting on cloud is also environmentally friendly, since cloud providers run massive server farms where their customers can share resources efficiently, instead of each organization running their own servers, which is highly inefficient. Some cloud providers are Microsoft Azure, Amazon Web Services, IBM Cloud, and Google Cloud Platform. Finally, cybersecurity or secure software development is a continuous process in the software development lifecycle. Secure coding practices ensure application confidentiality, integrity, and availability. This is especially important for critical applications that deal with sensitive data. So, that's basically all there is to software development. Pretty straightforward, I would say. Okay, that's not all of it, obviously, but I don't have the energy and you don't have the patience to go over everything. And by the way, who's even watching at this point? Let me know in the comments. It also helps with the YouTube algorithm. If you feel like you learned something today, give the video a like and share it with everyone. It pushes the video out to more people like you. Thanks. Thanks.